How Muslims in the GTA are celebrating the holy month of Ramadan. Happy Ramadan. We stand shoulder to shoulder with those that don't have much to eat. With grocery prices soaring, we're digging into quick decisions from families to make sure opening the fast each night doesn't open their wallets too wide. Plus, they pointed their guns at me right away. They shouted one command, and immediately I felt a shot. A man shot and critically injured by police speaks out why he and his lawyer argue the officers failed to properly de escalate. And the concern that there is uh, suspicion or the possibility of foul play. We'll break down the new information that's come to light that has police asking for your help in the disappearance of a GTA lawyer. Hey, good evening. Thanks for joining us. For many Muslims, the holy month of Ramadan kicks off tonight, and each night after the sun goes down, families will gather to celebrate and eat. But with so many people across the GTA struggling to stomach inflation at the grocery store, we wanted to look at how people are adjusting. And Dale Manukduk joins us live tonight from inside a mosque in Mississauga. Dale, what are people there telling you? Well, Chris, prayer service just ended here. More than 500 people took part. But every year, Ramadan really is about that prayer, about reflection, about community, and, of course, about the fasting. And the fasting is really meant to give people of all circumstance the experience of being without. Why that's so important this year is because so many people are experiencing food insecurity. We know that access to food banks has hit record highs. And so that empathy that comes from fasting is really vital to ensuring that nobody has to experience that type of hunger. I say happy Ramadan. Yeah, happy Ramadan to you. While the holy month of Ramadan is a time to celebrate with loved ones over food, it's also a time to be humble and think about the ones who don't have any. If you haven't eaten for 15, 16 hours, it takes a toll on you so you can feel the pe pe people that you know, have a food and they're, you know, they're hungry for the whole day. At the Mississauga Food Bank, Elise Joffrey Zaidi says during Ramadan, when it's time to open the fast each night, she often has a moment of true reflection. Wow, I have been blessed with so much that I was in the absence of for the past several hours, and now I will receive. And that really becomes a motivation to, to give to others and be more generous. The food bank is launching its annual Give 30 campaign, which aligns with Ramadan. It often sees a boost in monetary donations, especially from the Muslim community. Access to the food bank is up 60% compared to 2019 and still rising. February was a record-breaking month. January was a record-breaking month. December was a record-breaking month. And they're not the kind of records you want to break of the number of people using food banks. Meanwhile, at the Isna Canada Mosque, the community is always striving to help those in need, but especially over the next month. In fasting, we find a sense of solidarity. Those that are rich or those that are living lives of affluence and prosperity, we, we stand shoulder to shoulder with those that don't have much to eat. So, Chris, the Mississauga Food Bank now sees over 14,000 client visits per month. The CEO, Megan Nichols, says that many newcomers who are coming to Canada during this cost of living crisis are finding that the funds that they had set aside to help them settle don't go as far. So the food bank is really banking on the generosity of others, and the Muslim community here in Mississauga is really stepping up. Chris? Dale Manukduk reporting live for us from Mississauga. Thanks, Dale. Breaking news to tell you about out of Ottawa and Toronto area MP Han Dong has quit the Liberal caucus and will sit as an independent. What has been reported is false and I will defend myself against these absolutely untrue claims. His announcement comes after allegations surfaced in a global news report that his campaign benefited from election interference from China. CBC News has not verified the allegations, but Dong has admitted to speaking to a senior Chinese diplomat back in February of 2021. But he continues to deny allegations. He advised Beijing to delay releasing detained Canadians Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor to help his campaign. Now to the latest on a man who says he was the victim of a police failure to properly de-escalate. Devon Fallon was critically injured after he was shot multiple times by Toronto police. He admits he had a knife on him at the time, but he and his lawyer say police broke regular protocol. As Ali Shiasan reports, his lawyer is now demanding to see the police body camera footage. They pointed their guns at me right away. 
they shouted one command and immediately I felt a shot and right after I just heard multiple shots going off. Devon Fowlin is flanked by his family, his dog also by his side, just as she was on the day he was shot by Toronto police last month. Mr. Fowlin was at the park at Black Creek and Trettaway Drive in Toronto and it was approximately 7.45 to 8 o'clock in the morning. As his lawyer describes it, Fowlin was walking his dog and someone called police. Mr. Fowlin was approached by a, under, well, a police officer in an unmarked car and Mr. Fowlin uh, walked away, did not want to interact with that officer. He had been living in his car. Attorney Naya Singh says Fowlin had a knife on him for protection and when more officers arrived. They asked Mr. Fowlin to show his hands and show the knife. Mr. Fallon complied with that direction and immediately shots were fired against Mr. Fallon, multiple shots hitting him. The Special Investigations Unit is reviewing the interaction. Fallon and his lawyer argue there was little attempt to de-escalate. Just pure shock and trauma because it's not a regular police and uh, a procedure for what they've done. If a subject is bearing a knife, then the typical response would be to go to the firearm as a display first. Uh, and then verbal warnings accompanying the, the subject with the knife. Uh, and then eventually, if the officer believes there is an imminent threat, and that's a really key part of this is imminent threat. It doesn't mean immediate, but it does mean very, very soon of death or grievous bodily harm to either themselves or to a third party, then the officer would be lawfully in a position to shoot in that instance. Fallon's lawyer is requesting the police body camera footage from that morning. Criminology professor Patrick Watson says they're right to demand transparency because responding officers don't have to participate in the investigation. Right now, they have the right to remain silent like any other citizen. But unlike any other citizen, they are empowered to use lethal force against us with legal provision or legal cover. So I really think that we've seen past SIU directors and Mr. Singh saying, we should start compelling officers to speak to the SIU. Uh, like everybody to like hear my story just to uh, save lives and to prevent this from like happening to like to like anybody. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. New tonight, a break in a murder investigation. A Toronto man wanted on a Canada-wide warrant has been arrested and charged with murder. It is in relation to the stabbing death of 24-year-old Shaquan Harrison outside an Etobicoke banquet hall earlier this month. Police were called to the venue near Highway 27 at Steeles Avenue on the evening of March 10th for reports of gunfire. Police say there'd been an altercation with weapons involved and Harrison was stabbed and went to a nearby hospital where he later died. Today, 26-year-old Amari Bent turned himself into police. He's been charged with second-degree murder and is set to appear in court tomorrow. A new plan to update you on from the city and the transit authority, expanding mental health supports for vulnerable people. Funding for the new outreach was approved in the city's latest budget, and Greg Ross explains how it's expected to work. Today, we are proud to announce our one-year partnership with LOFT. This partnership will work towards our common goal of increasing safety and support on the TTC. The plan was first introduced and approved as part of last month's budget, a one-year pilot project the city will invest half a million dollars into. That money will be used to bring in support staff from LOFT Community Services, which provides support for people facing mental health challenges, addictions and homelessness. The team will help individuals by working with them one-on-one -on -one to meet their complex health and social care needs. We start by helping people with their basic needs, such as getting medical attention, and work with them to access things like income supports and other areas. It provides the opportunity to get people the health care, the social support, and access to long-term safe indoor space all of those things they so urgently need. Outreach workers will be deployed to areas they are needed the most. We are aware there are certain stations where people are sheltering more than others. We certainly will, we have identified those with our city partners. We're going to be starting there. Many who use the TTC say it's an important step. I like the idea and uh, I think they got to get to the root of the problem. I feel like that's a lot better than anything the police are going to do. But some transit advocates say this should only be the beginning and that far more resources need to be included in a program like this. 
But it is quite small, the scale of it. It's uh, three outreach workers and a nurse and uh, some psychiatrist support. Those outreach workers from Loft will be working closely with streets to homes workers from the city. And in terms of safety along the TTC, the city says they've also approved funding for 50 additional security guards. And the city says that those guards will also be trained in mental health, first aid and nonviolent intervention. Those security guards will also be out patrolling some of the most vulnerable areas along the TTC. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. Mostly a great day out there today, but we're certainly in for some wet weather. Colette Kennedy is here with a first look at the weather forecast. And Colette, you've got some advice for motorists who are traveling outside our region. Well, with the system moving in, which is mostly a rainmaker in terms of the impact it has on the GTA and what we're seeing as it's kind of working its way towards us and taking over, it's over towards eastern Ontario where we have that risk of freezing rain. And just in case anyone's got some traveling to do, because it's not just about what happens tonight, even early tomorrow morning, still a risk of at least some patchy freezing rain towards the nation's capital. And there's even a weather statement that extends towards Brockville uh, in there too because of those road conditions. But let's kind of take you through, and you can see the area there where the trouble spot is with the pink in there, freezing rain and some ice pellets. But it's this rainfall that's becoming more organized, making its way through the overnight hours across the GTA, still extending back into southwestern Ontario and still into eastern Ontario for the morning commute. But we will find things start to improve by the time we get to the afternoon. Now be aware, some fog development in areas that can be quite dense. Also know the temperature is going to be spiking in the morning hours. We're still going to get to those double digits, but then once that front goes through behind it, colder air will move in and we'll actually see our temperature falling off as we go into those afternoon hours. But we'll get some clearing in there too. So that's why the temperature story looks like this, becoming cooler by the time we get to those later afternoon hours, Chris. All right, Colette, thank you very much. On the eve of the provincial budget, the Toronto District School Board is asking the province to reimburse over $70 million in pandemic-related costs that were not covered by the Ministry of Education. In a letter to Stephen Lecce, the TDSB says it had to use reserve funds to cover the costs associated with health and safety directives, like reducing class sizes and remote learning. The board says it'll now face a deficit of about $61 million, and it says that could impact its ability to support programs and services for students. Stephen Lecce's office responding to the letter tonight in a statement that read, Ontario's government continues to fund education at the highest levels in our province's history. It goes on to say we provided $3 billion to the TDSB this year alone and look forward to increased investments where students need it the most, focused on reading and math skills. Meanwhile, to tee up the budget itself, Ontario's finance minister got himself a fancy new pair of shoes today. And Peter Bethlen Falvey gave a preview of one of the big items in the spending plan, a tax break for manufacturers. We'll be proposing the new Ontario-made investment tax credit. This new tax credit will help local manufacturing companies grow, innovate, become more competitive, and most importantly, create good paying jobs. The Premier also there for that announcement, and it is a 10% refundable tax credit, up to $2 million savings on building and equipment purchases by Canadian-controlled companies. It'll cost taxpayers $780 million over three years. Meanwhile, the Leader of the Opposition is hoping to see measures like expanded rent control and more affordable housing in tomorrow's budget. Uh, I'd like to see them actually uh, with bring forward measures that are going to make life better for real people. Uh, not big corporations, you know, regular people who are struggling right now every day. And I hear this government get up in the legislature every day and deny that anything is wrong as if they're living in like the twilight zone. Are we living on the same planet? And we'll learn all the budget details late tomorrow afternoon. The finance minister will stand up in the legislature to deliver it just after 4 p.m. And we'll have full coverage of what's in it, along with all the reaction on our show tomorrow night. CBC Toronto has learned new details tonight about the disappearance of a GTA lawyer, Isabella Dan. Several developments from investigators, including a multi-million dollar lawsuit and an abandoned luxury SUV, have officers asking for your help tonight. Far Morelli is digging into the new details. And Farah, it's been almost three weeks since she vanished, and there is growing concern for her safety. 
Yeah, Chris, it's not every day you see a lawyer, one with ties to their community, just suddenly vanish, and that's what makes this case so peculiar. We've uncovered new details that help paint a picture of Isabella Dan's life in the months before she disappeared. Now, what we know is that she was last seen in this area on the night of March 3rd. It's near Highway 7 and Warden and Markham. Police believe the 53-year-old lived in this area. We believe she lived alone and has no children, and it was actually her colleagues that reported or missing when she failed to actually show up for work. We've also learned she leased a gray Land Rover last summer. Police have confirmed to us that vehicle was found on site. But this is interesting. It wasn't found in the building's garage. Instead, investigators found it seemingly abandoned on the street nearby. Now, the case has now been handed over to York Regional Police's missing persons and homicide team. Some information uh, has been brought to the attention to the investigators that led uh, them to believe the circumstances for this particular case uh, is unusual and out of character and uh, the concern that there is uh, suspicion or the possibility of foul play. We do feel there are more people out in our community that know more things about her. Now, we had a chance to speak to a personal friend of Isabella Dan, who's understandably very worried. And what she told us is this. Dan is, quote, full of life. She's very outgoing, a very big person. I don't think she'd go missing or just pack her stuff and leave like that. She added, it's very concerning because it's been more than two weeks, says her friend. I'm just very concerned for her. She also said, I feel like people who are very close to her need to be investigated. Okay, Far, bring us up to speed on what you've learned from court records and other publicly available documents. Yeah, Chris, it's interesting because we got a snapshot of her finances from land registry records, and they show that Dan sold a home that she owned in Toronto last summer for about $2.7 million. At the time, it had a $2 million mortgage on it. She's still listed as the current owner of another home in North York, which she bought in 2020 for about a $1 million. That property now has two mortgages on it, totaling more than $1.4 million. We know at any missing persons investigation, police will likely look at someone's finances to see if that sheds light on the situation. We also learned that Dan is facing multiple civil court battles. She's named in four ongoing cases over at Ontario Superior Court, and these involve allegations of fraudulent mortgages taken out on properties in the GTA. I spoke with the lawyer for one of the plaintiffs suing her, and what he told me is they're not alleging that Dan benefited or initiated these alleged frauds, their claims focused on alleged negligence. And we know that Dan has already filed statements of defense to these allegations. Now, Chris, police do really believe there are people out there who know her that haven't come forward and they continue to unravel this very strange disappearance. Such a mystery, Farah. Thank you very much. Turning now to weather and double-digit temperatures to start our day tomorrow, but that won't last. Let's get back to Colette for our long-range forecast. And Colette, a lot is coming our way. Well, Chris, over these three days ahead of us, we essentially have two systems that are going to be working their way through. So uh, the day where it's going to be clearer and certainly quieter is going to be Friday. But I'll tell you, I expect that we'll get into some improvement for the second half of tomorrow even. So we've got the more organized rain that's moving through some of this dense fog uh, developing in certain areas, at least through the overnight and for tomorrow morning. In mild as the temperature comes up tomorrow morning and likely into the early afternoon, but then that cold front will go through. Now it's going to take some of the rain and the clouds eventually away, but it will drop our temperature as well. So it's kind of short lived and it comes with the wet conditions. And then for Saturday, it does still seem like the temperature profile is such that it may come in as a bit of a mix with some wet flurries, kind of a little bit of ice pellet activity, but then changes over to rain for the GTA and becomes more of a rain event, heavy at times, and windy conditions, even breezy into Sunday, in fact, although we'll lose some of that wet weather. So that's how it's looking right now. Now, a little further north and in other areas of the province, we're talking about it being a snow event. Let's just deal with this first system as it's bringing the wet weather into southwestern Ontario that continues to spread across. Earlier in the show, I was talking about that freezing rain as well into eastern Ontario so travel travelers note that and also note that we could have that reduced visibility
possibility with some of the fog tomorrow morning. But by afternoon, we see this pushing on. And later afternoon, we get some clearing, but that temperature will be falling off as we finally get that sunshine coming back at us. Then we're kind of seeing some cloud early on Friday. We should have it clearing out, though, as we get into the afternoon hour. So it really becomes quite a nice day. A little bit breezy as the system moves through, but not too bad. Nothing too significant. Just you'll notice it tomorrow afternoon. You'll also likely notice how the temperatures change here and actually coming up as we go towards those morning hours in many cases or remaining steady. There we go. As we get past tomorrow into Friday, improving conditions in the afternoon, seasonal high for us too, and then that mix into Saturday early, changing over to rain showers, and then we'll benefit beyond that as we head into Sunday and Monday. All right, Colette, thanks so much. And we're going to take a quick break. Be right back. This weekend, Toronto's professional women's hockey team will play the biggest game in franchise's history. The team is heading to Arizona to play in the Isabel Cup against the Minnesota Whitecaps. Today, we caught up with some of the players and their coach before they headed out. I think we're all super excited. Obviously, this is a goal of ours from the beginning of the year to get to Arizona. The one thing I know about the Minnesota is that they're fast and they never give up and they'll sacrifice and, and it's playoff hockey. And that's what the team that's going to do that is going to win the championship. So now back on Monday, the uh, Toronto Six beat Connecticut three to nothing, punching their ticket to play in the Isabel Cup for the first time in the team's history. And here's some more good news. The odds against the Whitecaps are in our favor. The Toronto Six have played Minnesota four times, winning each game. And puck drop is Sunday night at 9 p.m. Finally tonight, we have some exciting news about the Paralympic Games. CBC and Radio Canada will once again be partnering as your host networks for both the 2024 and 2026 Paralympics. As always, we'll have full TV, streaming and digital coverage of all the athletes, events and the ceremonies in both English and French. The Paris 2024 Games will take place in late August until early September next year. And in March of 2026, the uh, Winter Paralympics will be held in Italy. It's a long way off, but it's still exciting to know for sure. And that is our show for you tonight. Thanks so much for watching. Maribel Tarouk has your next local newscast tomorrow at 6, and I'll see you back here tomorrow night at 11. Have a great night, everyone.